and I'm going to turn my video off because the last time I gave this presentation, um, or last time I gave an everyday environment, I had to have Val share and I had to call in from my phone. So I'm going to minimize as much bandwidth as possible when it comes to using, um, when it comes to presenting today. So again, um, so lessons from nature in your home landscape. This is a topic that I'm really passionate about. It's something I do a lot in the programming in Cook County. As Val said, I'm a natural resources, environment and energy educator. Um, I work mainly in Cook, so Chicago and the south or in the surrounding suburbs, um, but I also have um, statewide duties. And so this is one of them is providing programming across the state on um, natural resource topics. And so I'm really excited to bring to you all today some of these um, lessons from nature. This is a little bit of a crash, crash course in ecology, um, basic ecology and how that's applied to decision making in our environment. Um, and so there, we'll be talking about some basic ecological concepts and how we use them in our everyday environment. Oh, look what I did there. Um, so to get us started, um, I wanted to share with you just some common things that I've been seeing. So between working with Extension and um, having friends and college, colleagues, you know, you get a you get to see things, you get to to knowing things, and just talking to friends and family and stuff, and just some some issues you pe see in people's yards. And so these are three really good examples of of some stuff that I've seen in the last few years. So. Um, this image on the left is a picture of a leaf from an apple tree that has cedar, cedar apple rust. And um, that um, tree is my father-in-law's and, and he you know, asked me what to do with it and I gave him some advice, but ultimately he's decided that the best option for him is to um, spray it like every, like twice a week um, because uh, with a, uh, an antifungal, um, and you know, that's been working for him, but he, it takes a lot of input. The middle image is, uh, not, it, and none of these images are, are like my friends and family's yards. I kind of wanted to respect their privacy, but these are representative of, of their spaces. Um, but this is, you know, an image of a lawn that's, that's looking a little patchy. Um, my friend has a dog. Um, and he, that dog, you know, dogs tend to tear up lawns, but um, what I've noticed is how he manages that lawn also causes some issues with, with um, that makes it more susceptible to damage. So he dethatches annually. Um, he also mows at two inches um, and um, like does all of the, the typical <laughs> lawn management things that as much as you can possibly do um, to it. The last image on the right shows a bed of hostas. Um, it's, it's a very weedy bed, but if you'll notice here down in this corner, there's like this bear patch and we tend to see this. Um, this is another friend of mine. He has um, these bear patches or they have, he has like creeping Charlie, like right around along the edges of his bed here. And he just kind of manages it by pulling it. Sometimes he sprays, um, but there's a common theme among all of these stories and that's is these living things the the apple tree and the fungus um the lawn and the the um hostas are all being um okay i just want to make sure i just saw some things in the chat okay cool um so um these are all being treated as if they're just kind of entities on our landscape and not exactly living and breathing things that have relationships with each other. And so when we're considering our landscapes and, and troubleshooting issues in our landscape, the first thing that we need to consider is that these things do not exist in isolation. Um, they're not just individual um, you know, trees or individual fungus, individual problems. Their relationships are not just with the humans that are cultivating them, but with the other aspects on the landscape, with the light, with the water, with the soil, with the um, other living plants, with the animals on that landscape as well. And so thinking about these things beyond just their individual plants, but as part of a larger system. And you can take that a step further if you look um, at satellite maps of, um, you know, we're not looking at now just individual yards, we're looking at whole, whole communities or whole spaces. So this is a satellite map of central Illinois, Pleasant Plains to be exact. So if you're from that area, shout out to you. Um, 
the Sangamon River is just east of here. And then this is about uh, just northwest of Springfield, Illinois. So um, this is kind of central area. And I would love in the chat, in the, co in, the, in the chat box, if you all could just type what you notice, what kinds of things do you observe when looking at this, this image? Yeah, getting some good comments in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm seeing here too much turf, ag fields, trees and green space, grids, um, farmland, not a lot of prairie, ag, a mixed use ag home landscapes. Um, there's trees, there's bare spots, cultivated fields. Yeah, lots of different things. There's roads, intersections, um, lots of different pieces here, lots of different land uses, land functions going on here. There's these agricultural fields right up against these, these um, this more forested area, but then there's these um, residential landscapes going on here, lots of turf that we can see, right? Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next image. So um, if you were like, wait, I wanna see my, <laughs> my community represented. I'm not going to show every community in Illinois, um, but this is Southern Illinois, Illinois. The body of water that you see here is the Lake of Egypt, just south of Marion. Um, and go ahead and type in the chat what you notice now. Yeah, so this is a less urbanized environment. Keep it coming, people. More green space. There's more water. There's water in between. People are mentioning floodplains. The water looks green. Yeah, probably. Um, less concrete roadways. Lots of green and water. Yeah, so we're seeing lots of these different landscapes. We're seeing this integration of water into the landscape. This is all over this image. Um, there's a the contrast of urban and farms. So we're seeing, you know, communities over here. We're even seeing some farmland. This is actually Shawnee National Forest, um, but this river really dominates how the landscape is shaped for sure. Yeah, these are all really spaces that are connected with water. Now I have one more to show you. So this is quite a different landscape. This is South Suburban Cook County. Um, and so go ahead and type in the chat one more time, what kinds of things you notice. Yeah, there's more dense residential areas. Um, there's home landscapes. There's less uh, obvious green space. It's very urban. Um, the natural areas are more isolated. More concrete, less green. So this actually up here is a forest preserve space, in case you wanted like a little. Yeah, not much as green as previous. It's a very different landscape. Um, now, this is like about as zoomed in as the others are, and so I'm sure if we zoomed in a little bit more, we could see, I think, I can't remember exactly how, um, what the zoom exactly was on this, but yeah, looks like where we live. It is, it is close to where I live too, actually, um, so it's... Um, so anyway, so when we look at these maps, um, I, one person noticed earlier when we were looking at the central Illinois landscape, we see a lot of squares. Um, and one thing I wanna point out about that is back in the 1800s, um, the Homestead Act designated that we got a hundred, that you received 160 free acres. Um, and that's pretty much designated the squares that we see today. So, you know, we have these perfect little squares. And when we look at every single um, of these images. This one's the most obvious, right? That we have these defined property lines. 
you know, when we look here, we can see that, you know, we have these roads that are cutting things off and we're like, these are clearly more um, developed areas, even if it's in, you know, a, a more green space um, community. Um, but we have, you know, these developed areas, these squares that we've decided, you know, this is where, um, you know, this is where our landscape is. Um, and then we've decided that, you know, this is where nature's going to live. This is where the natural spaces are. This is where that kind of ecological mindset is going to be applied. Um, but what we know for sure is that nature doesn't really pay attention to those nice little squares. Um, just because there's a road or a fence or somebody drew an arbitrary political boundary between states um, or counties or properties that doesn't stop a seed from spreading through wind or a bird from pooping on your property um, compared where it picked up a seed on the adjacent property. Um, it doesn't stop a deer from hopping it, a fence. Um, and so we know that these landscapes are connected regardless of who owns or manages them or what they're designated for. And so um, this is another map of Cook County is just a little closer. So this is forest preserve property right here. Um, and in Illinois, 10% of land is public. So protecting these small percentage and even that's just the public land, right? That's not like, you know, na natural space designated. Um, that's not a percentage. That's just 10% of land that's publicly managed. Um, and so, you know, these small percentage of land that is, designated for natural spaces that uses this ecological management, um, it's, it's really amazing and it really creates these really high quality habitats, but it's not, a, it's not really um, getting us anywhere because we're seeing that these spaces are right up against these urban spaces. Was I think Emily wrote in the comments, um, pockets of green spaces that have small connections. Um, and so these connections, you know, we kind of see them, maybe they're grass waterways or they're little streams, but we're not really seeing, you know, there's a lot of, um, we're seeing that, you know, the things that exist here can exist here and the things that are growing here are showing up in here is what I'm trying, I guess what I'm trying to get at. So these things are all connected, whether it's through, you know, um, herbivory or through, you know, energy transfer of eating other things, but also the non-living things are connected. Our waterways are connected. This is the Mississippi, it's a, a illustration of the Mississippi River Valley um, <clears throat> watershed. And it shows that all of this water um, drains to the Gulf of Mexico. And so you can see Illinois is completely covered here with this very, very tiny exception of right on the um, Lake Michigan shore. And so we're seeing that all of this is connected. And when I see these things, I don't see sadness. I don't see, I, you know, I don't, I don't see it negatively. I actually see it as like this huge opportunity for all of this land to um, look at it like we look at these natural areas and take the lessons that these restoration ecologists are using to manage their natural areas and applying it to our own properties. And so that's kind of what I wanna look at is how can we do that? Um, and to do that, we have to first look at, well, what's the current state of our landscapes? All of our landscapes, the standard landscape, standard property in Illinois and in most of the country is um, turf. Um, turf is actually the most abundant crop, irrigated crop in the United States. Um, it is, we, we water it, we add chemicals to it, we do whatever to it, we do a lot to it. It is the most abundant and it is a large monoculture. Um, uh, it's just a singular plant in an entire space. And this is kind of what our current landscapes look like. We have these green grasses that we water and they'll add a lot of input in. And then we have these, you know, nice little prim edges um, with plants that, you know, aren't making too much of a buzz. Um, you know, they're not attracting too many bees. They're keeping things nice and neat and manicured. Um, and, you know, we can, we can do something differently here. There's a little bit more of an opportunity when we're looking at this. And so because, you know, that's the current state of our landscapes, we see this larger um, ecosystems wide effect um, that's beyond just our regular property levels. So we're seeing that our landscapes are fragmented. 
you know, we have these giant roads in between them. We have, you know, one neighbor to the next isn't providing as much um, ecological value. We're inputting a lot of harmful chemicals to them because we're channeling all of our water um, instead of allowing it to infiltrate into the soil. And we're um, trying to, we're putting up levees and we're trying to reduce um, floodplains. Um, we're seeing a lot of stormwater runoff that causes these extreme flooding events. And these are only going to be more frequent as climate change progresses. And then lastly, we're having really poor wildlife habitat. Now this image is kind of funny um, because I, I wonder if a coyote maybe isn't the most charismatic thing that want, people wanna attract in their yards. I think they're really neat, but I know they provide a lot of negative associations. Wildlife is also insects um, and insects are essential for our food source. Um, they're essential for the growth of many of our plants that we love. And so wildlife habitat is essential to the health of our landscapes. So this idea, this concept of learning lessons from nature is, it's not just reserved for forest preserves. It's not just reserved for ecologists and, and managers of natural lands. Um, we can utilize these concepts right here in our yard and on our very landscapes, and we can make a really big difference because of it. And we can also save ourselves a lot of headaches. So I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes or so um, sharing with you all the things that you can incorporate um, into your landscape by using these three basic ecological concepts and how you can apply them. So I'm gonna be looking at relationships in nature, what those look like, how we can use those. I'm going to be using the term, using them to our advantage. Um, I'm, I kind of, what I'm trying to say is like to leverage those so that way we can help improve the ecosystem and also decrease negative um, aspects that, that negatively affect us and negatively affect the ecosystem. Um, but I often find myself referring back to using it to our advantage. So I just don't, I want to make sure I clarify that. We're also going to be understanding like what is natural selection and evolution? What the heck is that? We talk about it all the time. We use this term adaptations, but let's make sure we really understand it. And then lastly, really taking some lessons from the cycles that naturally occur in nature. So um, I'd rather, I could read through a list of tips, but I'd rather frame it in a little bit of an ecosystem because I think that makes it kind of fun. Um, and so I wanna talk about my favorite plant in the whole world, which happens to be our state tree. So our story today focuses on getting uh, um, to know a species that you all may be familiar with. Um, the white oak, scientific name Quercus alba, is our state tree. Um, and it's really a staple in our Illinois wood woodlands. Um, it also happens to make a really great tree on our, on our home landscapes. It has this really great ability to adapt to less than ideal conditions. It lives a really long time and it's got this really nice sturdy tap root. You can find them across natural and cultivated landscapes. I have, I know it's like a standard um, parkway tree in my community. Um, they also have this really essential role ecologically and they serve as this really cool representation of how nature can be a model for our cultivated landscapes. So let's practice what we preach. Let's get to know this white oak tree. Um, so it's found in almost every, or not in almost, in every county in Illinois. And it's cultivated um, in a cultivated environment. It prefers full or partial sun. It prefers moderate moisture, but it can handle dry conditions. The only thing it really doesn't like is these is flooded conditions. Um, it adapts really well to soil, to sandy loams to clay loams and even gravelly or rocky materials. And this tree can live to be up to 600 years old, which is pretty cool. It's got this beautifully lobed leaves. Um, and because it's an oak species, it produces acorns that mature in the fall, excuse me. And their leaves turn this really beautiful, um, like reddish yellow color at that time as well. Love this tree, it's great, it's gorgeous. I could get to know this tree all day. So let's talk, now that we know the, the individual, let's talk about its interactions with the environment. Let's talk about the ecology of it. So we're gonna place it in an ecosystem. Um, and so we're going to get to know the relationships that occur with around this tree. And so you may be familiar with a few different kinds of relationships that occur um, in an environment. There's lots of different names for them, lots of different ideas. Um, take a second and think about different ways that 
organisms interact in an ecosystem. So take a second to think about it. How do organisms interact in an ecosystem? Okay, and go ahead and type in the chat some, some interactions that occur in an ecosystem. Yes, yeah, symbiotic. Some of them are working together that are mutually beneficial, amazing, that some feed off of one another, seed dispersal, gas exchange, parasitic, so eating or um, taking off an, um, energy from another to the detriment of that organism without killing it quite, um, host plants, pests, nesting environments, sharing moisture, wonderful. These are all really, really wonderful examples. Keep them coming. I'm going to... Um, explain some of the oak ones, but if you if you had one in mind, go ahead and type it in the chat. It's nice to have like a list. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, this idea of eating one another. Um, and I'm gonna go with um, this concept of herbivory, which is animals eating plants. Um, and so when it comes to herbivory, I like to talk about caterpillars because if you've ever raised a swallowtail or a monarch, you know that these suckers like to chow down. Um, one of our caterpillars um, that is dependent on the oak tree is the white M hair streak caterpillar. Um, and I have a picture of the adult. These, um, the caterpillar themselves are this yellow green. They're not really charismatic looking guys, so much so that I could not find like an open source picture on. <laughs> Um, and so it, I will continue looking for one to help improve this, this presentation, but um, this is what the adult looks like. Um, but this particular species relies on the foliage of oak trees in particular, um, even the ones in your yard. Um, and so this is a beautiful butterfly and it will grow up to feed on the nectar of other flowering plants, including viburnums, common milkweed, dogwoods, goldenrods. Um, but to reproduce, this butterfly specifically needs an oak species. And so because you can't have the butterfly without the caterpillar, um, you know, you want to enjoy the butterfly, you have to have an oak species in order for it to succeed. So another relationship, again, we're talking about continuing on with the eating, um, is a predator-prey relationship. So the um, uh, we're going to call them insectivore, but carnivore essentially is animals that eat other animals. Um, and so when thinking about our butterfly, our white M hair streak, our caterpillar, a common predator and food staple um, for many birds is caterpillars. Um, caterpillars are considered the sausages of the insect world. They have these really soft bodies. They're high in nutrients. They pack this really big protein pr um, punch. Um, especially compared to their crunchy adult counterparts, which aren't as nutrition, high nutrition. Um, and so one bird that we'll see commonly in our landscape is the Northern Cardinal. I have a, a pair in my backyard, a, a breeding pair in my backyard, and I just love looking at them. Um, and caterpillars are a staple of their spring diet. Um, it also happens to be, like I said, they it's it, this is a wonderful habitat for our cardinals. They like this open, semi-clear habitat. Um, okay, so I'm going to check to see if anybody mentioned this. I don't, I think there was mention of pollination, but that's the next relationship I'm going to talk about before I go too far back. Geese pooping in lawns, that's really funny. Um, so um, the next relationship I want to talk about is pollination. So our oak tree is wind pollinated. So it relies on abiotic or non-living factors for fruiting and reproduction. But there are a lot of other species that rely on insect pollination, plants such as the flowering dogwood um, and other species which bring these beautiful flowers um, in the spring, they rely on insect pollination from our bees, moths, and yes, even our butterflies. And so as you can see, our oak tree supports the larval species of these pollinators which then allow which then allows them to become adults and go on to pollinate other species. So even though, you know, an oak tree doesn't directly um, pollinate these dogwoods, they're supporting the pollination of other species by supporting the caterpillars. 
And these relationships in nature are essential to our ecosystem. So, you know, we have here, I created like a really rudimentary food web, um, putting our oak tree as the plant kind of in the center of it. Um, you know, we learned about these basic food webs, maybe in grade school or something. Um, but there are all these other relationships that are also occurring in nature that um, you all mentioned in the chat. Um, lots of different, you know, the goose pooping on the lawn is, you know, providing maybe sometimes too many nutrients, but providing nutrients back into the soil. And so I could make this, um, you know, really rudimentary web much more complex. I could add a million more arrows, but these were just like some basic ones that show that, you know, there's other things going on here. We're having animals disperse seeds, you know, the predators are helping control disease of the smaller um, uh, animal species. And so we're seeing um, lots of different relationships and lots of different interconnectedness occurring here. And so how can we learn lessons from these relationships? How can we look at the relationships in nature and how can we apply them to our own landscape? And there's a few ways that we can do that. We really, what we need to do is create spaces that build those relationships and then utilize them, those relationships to balance out the imbalances that we've created. So first, we, how do we create beneficial habitat? Um, there's a lot of different ways. I'm going to go through a few. Um, first, you know, typically in the fall, we do a fall cleanup. We take away all the brush um, and leave essentially like a flat landscape. Um, that is actually reducing a lot of really important habitat for our insects. So letting vegetation stand over the fall and winter. Same with logs and brush. Um, you know, I have like a little brush pile in my backyard. Um, where I keep a lot of those things and a lot of insects like to live in there, which provides essential food um, for smaller animals as well. Leaving natural nesting sites, having a diversity in, um, you know, layers in your, in your landscape, you know, having taller plants and shorter plants and shrubs and trees, as well as your, um, your herbaceous perennials. Leaving a small amount of bare soil, um, you know, some people read this and are like, oh, but what about, you know, that's eroding my soil that allows for it to dry out. Well, a lot of our native bees, most of our native bees actually in Illinois are ground nesting solitary bees and they require bare soil in order to reproduce. The last thing I have on this list is houses. So bird houses, bat houses, bee houses. I have it last on this list and I always add it with a, um, a little bit of like, mm, should I add it? Should I not? because these houses are important if you manage them appropriately. So only add them if you plan on the maintenance of them. So they need to be regularly cleaned out each year. Um, they need to be placed in an appropriate space. Um, there's a study that came out from the university actually that state, that found that you know we were putting bat boxes up everywhere, but putting them in a spot that gets a lot of sun, a lot of heat, um, essentially overheats the bats that live within that house. Same thing happens with bee houses. If you put them on the side of your house and that's a really high sun area, you're essentially um, killing off those bees. Additionally, if you don't clean them regularly, you're creating a breeding ground for diseases um, for those animals that you're trying to help. So just kind of, I put houses on there with like, I should put like a little asterisk or star next to it because I really wanna make sure that we're thinking critically about, um, we're not just adding them and, and never touching them again. Another thing that we can, so we talked about building habitat and building those spaces where those relationships can occur, but also we want to think about how we can um, balance those relationships. Oftentimes in our urban landscape, we've um, given advantage to one in particular, incidentally through an invasive species or something um, or other pests. And so how can we balance these relationships back out? And integrated pest management is a really wonderful way to do that. Um, oftentimes when we're looking at managing pests, we don't like the default is to remove some kind of remove it through some kind of chemical, um, or we remove it ourselves. So we often think about the relationship of the pest with, with us. Um, in reality, nature typically has a great way of taking care of it, or maybe just a few simple shifts can help nature take care of it. Um, and so we'll look, um, so looking at those relationships, um, and using them to our advantage in the landscape. And that's kind of what IPM is about. This is the formal theory behind IPM from the Environmental Protection um, Agency. I don't wanna go through the definition 
in its entirety, what I want to just point out to you is that in this formal definition, they talk about that it's using the information, um, the life cycle of pests and their interactions with the environment. And so it's all right there. It's talking about the relationships that these, e these animals and um, plants and fungus and diseases have with each other. And so, like I said, we could do a whole presentation on IPM. We're not going to. Um, so this is my last slide on it, actually. But I wanted to kind of give you an idea of how it works and why this is about the relationships in nature. Um, and so how, it, how this works is there, this is the basic IPM pyramid. And when addressing a pest, you want to get to know it a little bit and figure out, you know, when is what does it eat? How does it grow? Things like that. And then you want to use these different strategies working from the bottom up. So starting with cultural strategies, moving up to mechanical, then biological, and finally chemical. An important aspect of pesticide or of, of or pest management, but the final aspect of pest management. So what really is um, kind of thinking about the relationships is this cultural base of the pyramid. It's essentially involving plants growing things to be healthy, um, thinking about where your plants are located, um, where, how are they in relationship with one another. That example, like I said, of the, of the cedar apple rust, um, you know, having a plant so many feet close to a juniper species or a cedar species um, is what's going to make it more likely to be susceptible and have that disease. Um, making sure it's it's healthy. Um, so oftentimes we see grasses um, that are patchy or that are, have a lot of, you know, quote, weeds in them. That's often because that grass isn't healthy. Um, that grass is either mowed too short or, um, you know, the soil is depleted too much. And so having plants that are healthy are, are less susceptible to diseases. The last thing I want to mention here is, you know, there's, I lost my mouse. Um, there's all these aspects. Biological may feel like it's part of that relationships in nature. There's a reason it's above mechanical, and that's because it's actually introducing living organisms. It's not just like, you know, planting things that are preventative. Um, biological, a good example of a bi biological mechanism in IPM is um, ladybugs. Is you know, you can buy ladybugs online or from a store and use them to to reduce aphid species. Um, that's a good example because you're not a, you're not planting something to attract ladybugs. You're introducing that actual species, that actual predator, into the environment. So that's the difference between those two things. Because I know that can get confusing. So. Again, we're looking at our relationships in nature. That's our ecology lesson number one. What are those relationships in nature? And we can apply them by creating beneficial, um, apply this, this lesson by creating beneficial habitat and utilizing IPM. So we're coming back to our oak landscape. Um, and we have our oak tree and we looked at, you know, the individual relationships, but those are not the only aspects of our ecosystem. There are also a lot of other things going on. There's different niches or different spaces that other um, animals and plants are taking up um, the eek um, created by this whole system. For example, our, create, our tree creates shade directly underneath, and then it has this dappled shade throughout. And these different abiotic conditions um, or non-living conditions of, of light and um, water and soil um, are creating different spaces for plants and animals underneath. This is what we call differentiated habitat. And so from up high in the tree, there are squirrels and birds, there's environments um, and habitat that's suitable for them. The holes in the trunks are for, you know, down low for raccoons or, you know, up, or high, up higher for cavity nesting birds. And so this differentiated habitat allows for an ecosystem to thrive. This is the key to this idea of biodiversity and what allows for species to be successful to be able to reproduce. So that leads us to this, you know, ecological concept of natural selection. So natural selection, I'm going to read the definition that I'm going to go through it, is a mechanism of ev evolution by which organisms with traits make them best adapted to their environment reproduce and leave more young than others in the population. Over time, this trait becomes common to the population. This, um, the idea is kind of simple, but it 
I can understand where it can get really confusing. Um, and so I'm going to go through an example. So within a population, there's a natural variation of traits. So let's, you know, talk about a population specifically. Um, let's say um, a community of beetles, a population of beetles. Some of these beetles are brown and some of them are green. And so our environment has these natural pressures that make some traits preferential over others. In this example, let's say our beetles live on wood logs um, and the beetles are especially delicious to some birds. And the green beetles are more easily spotted than the brown beetles. So if the green beetles are being eaten, those are the ones that have less opportunities to reproduce because there are physically less of them because something is taking them out of the environment. And because color trait is hereditary um, or it's inherited from parent to offspring, the brown beetles, because there are physically more of them, they're not being eaten as often, have more option or more opportunities to reproduce, more opportunities to pass the brown color gene on. So if we take this a step further, we may notice that the brown beetles are best adapted to survive on these little logs because they match the color of this log. They're much less likely to be eaten by predators. And this is something that exists in all things in nature. When we talk about adaptations, we're talking about traits that are inherited from the parents that made those the parents of that um, individual more likely to survive and more reproductively successful. We're not talking about something that over that um, you know, species lifetime, you know, this bird was able to learn how to do something. No, this is a trait that was inherited by that, um, by their parent, from their parents. So if the offspring of the brown beetle um, continues on in this, it continues to live on a brown log, they will be, continue to be more successful than those who are not brown, right? Than those who are green or any other color. So this is essential for understanding our, our landscapes. Um, this idea, this concept of natural selection and evolution allows us to understand um, our landscapes by showing us the importance of diversity, the importance of biodiversity. Those selective pressures come from other aspects of the ecosystem. It doesn't just have to be you know, a predator-prey relationship. It could also be um, competition, you know, maybe these four plants all growing around a certain area, if they all have the same needs, the one that has, you know, a, a deeper root system to gather more water from lower is possibly going to be able to reproduce easier than um, same plants within those species who do not have that specific trait. And so we want to see more biodiversity. We want to see diversified needs within our landscape. So not only do we encourage competition, but we also are encouraging the establishment of different um, niches or needs in our ecosystem. So other sources of food and nutrients available. So this diversified needs allows for the resilience of an ecosystem. We're allowing for our ecosystem to um, face challenges and still bounce back. Um, and we've seen uh, negative, this happen in a lot of different landscapes, the opposite of this happen. Um, the University of Illinois quad and a lot of the um, campus used to have chestnut trees all over it. Um, and then chestnut blight came about. And because of the abundance of chestnut trees in urban landscapes, um, that disease spread like wildfire. And the same thing is happening with our emerald ash borer trees. We're seeing um, entire streetscapes wiped out with trees because the entire treescape was um, ash trees. And so we want to think about these diversified needs, these um, how can we um, allow for biodiversity so that way um, different uh, niches can occur in these environments. And so the first thing that we want to do is we want to decrease the monocultures, take stock of, you know, where is there a lot of the same thing that can spread diseases really easy and really quickly um, and how and do not support a lot of diversity and um, how do we reduce that and so the first thing that I mentioned a while ago is our lawn size um, it is a large monoculture across our country um, and so looking at it and asking ourselves 
what do I use my lawn for? Maybe I like it because my kids can play sports and games on it. Um, is there another plant or is there a diversity of plants that they could still do that? If not, that's okay. Or could I reduce it? Do I need the whole space to be lawn? You know, for example, my front yard is lawn and we've reduced it because I was like, we don't really play on there. It's not really great, but we have a side yard that we like to use um, for that. Another thing is invasive species. Um, oftentimes are, um, and I want to be clear, we're not talking about weeds. We're not talking about dandelions. We're not talking about even creeping Charlie. We're talking about garlic mustard. Um, we're talking about buckthorn um, and the countless other invasives across the country or across the state. Um, we want to, these are, these invasive species are very good at creating monocultures as well. And so they're reducing the, the biodiversity, the, the, diversity of habitats, diversity of ecosystems, niches um, in our environment um, that are um, not allowing for as productive ecosystem. So once we've reduced that monoculture, we wanna increase the diversity on the landscape. Um, I have like a couple of different, like I said, this allows for different abiotic conditions, different light conditions, different soil conditions, um, water conditions. But I like to, as a general rule of like how to do that, um, you know, our program and cook, we like to say we, we want to see 20 plus species on your landscape. Um, and that's a mixture of native herbaceous perennials and native trees and shrubs because it creates that diversified conditions. Um, if, and also diversifying your food sources for your landscape. So I like to say a rule of three, three blooms for each of the three growing season that allows you to have, you know, different kinds of plants, things like that. Ah, yes, the pear tree. I just wrote an article on the calorie pear. <laughs> I, I feel you with that one. That one's uh, becoming a huge issue in a lot of grasslands as well. So the last thing that we want to take or that we want to um, really learn our lesson from when it comes to natural selection and evolution is don't fight the site. Another name for this is right plant, right place. Um, essentially, um, our, as I was um talking about and breaking down this idea of natural selection and evolution, we have plants that are, have um, evolved and developed adaptations to our um, environment specifically in Illinois and to our soil conditions. Um, and so we want to take it, we want to take advantage of that. We want to say, hey, there's a plant that I don't have to water all the time, that I don't have to add extra inputs to. And hey, if I do the planting right in the way that, um, you know, ecosystems evolved, I don't have to weed that much either. Um, there's some really great resources from the Red Oak Rain Garden that talks about, you know, ground cover species um, that allows for, you know, reduction of, of unwanted um, plants. Um, and so I, I encourage you to kind of check out some other landscape designs that aren't so, um, you know, spread out and don't that allow for <laughs> um, a lot of light to break in between. I'm also making a lot of hand gestures that no one can see, I just realized. So that's kind of our idea of natural selection and evolution. That's our lesson that we want to learn. We want to encourage diversity on the landscape so that way these selective pressures can come from other aspects of the ecosystem and allow for high fitness of our species um, that we're planting in our ecosystem. So Back to our oak tree for our last lesson in ecology. Um, so I wanna talk about one of my favorite adaptations of the oak tree. Um, and the white oak does this as well as beeches exhibit this trait as well. And it's called marquescence. Um, this is the idea, the concept that even though the foliage of the tree is dead, the leaves do not drop. Um, so this is actually an image of uh, of a tree in a, in a parkway across the street from me that this image was taken in February. Um, there's a lot of theories as to why this occurs. Researchers are not quite sure. They don't have an exact answer. Um, some of the theories are it protects from winter wind. Some theorize it's to deter deer browsing. Um, and another idea is to get a jump on spring nutrients. So the leaves eventually do fall in the spring when new growth occurs and the fresh layer of nutrients fall to the ground, ready to decompose and provide um, you know, carbon and nitrogen to the tree. And so when the leaves eventually do fall to the ground in the spring, the carbon that exists in the leaves as plant 
um, exists in the leaves as plant biomass. And from there, it's broken down by bacteria and other decomposers to ultimately make its way into the soil and increase soil carbon. Soil carbon is essential for the health of the ecosystem, and it makes the soil more abs water absorbent, excuse me, more nutrient capable, and it also aerates the soil. So um, that kind of gives us a jump start into this idea of carbon cycling. So um, through respiration, which is a natural process of consuming sugars and producing energy, animals and plants convert biomass um, to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that's this portion right here and the plants respiring as well. Um, and now soil carbon can also go through a decomposition process, um, essentially when it's exposed to oxygen, it, um, it decomposes into carbon dioxide. So that's part of this as well. Um, and then the carbon dioxide can then be converted back to plant biomass through the process of photosynthesis. Now there's more processes occurring in the ocean and also human interventions in the carbon cycle, but I wanna focus on the land and where, and what occurs without human interventions for a minute to kind of show us um, what is naturally occurring. And so, you know, this is one cycle. There's also another cycle that occurs in our ecosystem, um, and that is the nitrogen cycle. Um, this one's a bit more complicated. And if you ever had, you know, like if you were in grade school um, or high school and you were like, oh yeah, the, the, the carbon cycle, or if you ever took a biology class in, in college, you probably were like, yep, we had to memorize all these things. Um, but I'll give you the, the quick and dirty of it. The nitrogen cycle is um, essentially there's a form of nitrogen in our atmosphere that can't be used by plants. Um, and a carrier, in this case, nitrogen fixing bacteria, alters the nitrogen to a more usable form by plants. Um, that usable form is then taken up by plants or it's then released back into the atmosphere, atmosphere through more bacteria. Then um, the form that it stays in the leaves is taken up by the plants and then released back into the soil when the bacteria decomposes those leaves to be usable by plants again. So this is kind of the quick and dirty of these two basic elemental cycles in our ecosystems. Um, but why do these matter? Well, they explain a lot and they give us a lot, some really interesting insights into how to manage our landscapes um, when it comes to soil conservation. Um, and so something that we can learn from these cycles is we need to maintain and encourage these cycles. A lot of these um, ways that we're managing these cycles is not cyclical at all in our current um, landscapes where it's very linear. You know, think of the way that we manage our lawns. Um, we add input to them. The grass grows um, using those inputs of fertilizers. Then we cut the grass and oftentimes we bag it and then let the city take it away. Now we've just taken though that carbon um, and the, that nitrogen that was in the soil, and we are um, specifically just taking it away um, and instead um, of leaving the grass clippings and allowing it to return back in. So there's a couple things we can do. We can leave content over the winter, like we were talking about with habitat, composting plant material when we're worried about, you know, not leaving it in the first place, composting it instead chop and drop. So during your spring cleanup or um, hopefully spring cleanup, now that I've convinced you all to not do a fall cleanup, right? Um, you're chopping and you're just dropping the, 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 um, the uh, plant material, leaving those grass clippings, and then just reducing synthetic fertilizers um, because then we're just adding to a nutrient cycle. Um, what we want to do instead is condition the soil, is add, have those nutrients be taken into the soil itself as opposed to just adding materials that are just meant to be taken up by plants. So then what happens to the water though? So we were talking about a, um, you know, the carbon and the nitrogen cycles, but there's also a really important cycle that occurs in our ecosystems and that's water. Um, so there is naturally occurring water vapor in our atmosphere. And when saturated enough and with some other cloud forming factors, we form clouds that causes precipitation on our oak tree and landscape. Um, you know, it could be snow if it's really cold out, but essentially this precipitation falls to the ground and, um, it can do a few things in our landscapes. It can either run directly on the surface into the closest waterway. Um, 
on the closest waterway, or it can infiltrate into the soil as soil moisture or groundwater and absorbed by plants, where it eventually makes its way to the ocean or it will evaporate and transpire back into the atmosphere. Um, follow, and this follows a similar process in the ocean, essentially restarting the cycle, right? And now when we go back to our water cycle, water, when water runs across our landscape, it doesn't just flow to the, um, it goes to the closest waterway. And this idea is a watershed. A watershed, just like the image showed, is the area of land that drains to a particular point in our stream. And so our water is all connected and, like I said, does not recognize political boundaries, aka your property versus your neighbor's property. And so water is also, you know, one of the most powerful forces in the world. Um, essentially, the faster it goes, the more it can carry. Um, and so slower streams aren't going to move as much sediment, for example, but a really quick moving stream is going to pick up a lot along the way and not allow for settling. So when we ask ourselves which process is slower, percolation, infiltration into the soil, or runoff to the nearest body of water, the answer is infiltration. Um, so we want to promote as much of that infiltration as possible. So that's what we're... Um, we're talking about when we want to when we're saying what kind of lessons can we learn about nature's cycles you know we looked at our our nutrient cycles now let's look at our water cycle we want to slow down the water on our property how do we do that there's a few ways we can um, the biggest impermeable surface on our property is typically our house um, and so how about we collect that water or we channel it into a space where it can sit a little bit longer and then it can be released. Um, we can redirect our downspouts so they're not on a impermeable surface and going into a garden bed, for example, or we can redesign some of our impermeable spaces to be more permeable. Um, if you have the opportunity and the, um, the financial availability to convert your walkways to permeable pavement or your driveways, um, that's a really wonderful way to allow for water infiltration. Another thing we want to consider because we are part of um, a watershed is to reduce our chemical use, that water is connected. Um, so utilizing these prevention strategies through IPM, um, instead of adding chemicals to the soil, um, without knowing what you need to treat exactly, get a soil test first. Um, and then also building up your soil through composting instead of adding chemicals. Um, these um, adding compost to the soil allows the soil to um, build up its nutrients naturally as opposed to um, just adding a specific chemical throughout. So those are some of the lessons that we're learning through nature's cycles. Um, we're encouraging these cycles, we're maintaining them, we're slowing down the water and reducing our chemical use. So these are these, here are these basic lessons on ecology. Um, and you know, I've sat here and I've talked for about 55 minutes and I'm gonna spend maybe two or three minutes more um, and, and kind of show you what this, what this physically looks like. So I've given you a lot of tips but I want to show you that, you know, you may be thinking, I really don't want my yard to look like a native uh, ecosystem. I don't want it to look like a prairie or a forest. Um, and the difference that is it's all in the design. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can implement um, classic design principles with native landscapes, with these ideas of of um, these ecological lessons that I've been I've been talking about, and so you know instead of having you know a wild prairie like this and having you know bergamot all over the landscape, maybe you have bunches of it throughout. Although bergamot, maybe I wouldn't recommend because it tends to um, take over a little bit. But you know this design, for example, has like some really nice coneflower and bunches. They have clear defined plantings um, and borders. And they can make these spaces look really beautiful. This is a garden um, that was planted at a school that, you know, went from a really, um, you know, kind of not very interesting space, not very inviting to this really beautiful inviting space. And they even did incorporate some design. They have the um, taller elements in the back and the shorter in the front to um, deter from flopping. You can use, um, if you do like a more wilder look, there's also an option of just making it an edge bed. Um, so this is a little more wilder look, but they've made a clearly defined edge to it. Um, you can use natural elements for design. You know, this person used rock, oh, this person used rocked and hardscapes. This person um, found that, you know, they were cutting down a tree. And so they used the, the logs as part of their natural design. And these can look good on lots of different kinds of landscapes, not just 
um, you know, bigger landscapes, but on smaller, you know, quarter acre lots, not even. Um, this person really like had a newer planting, but they have these clearly defined um, little plants. Um, this person really incorporated a lot of other hardscapes like design elements and art, um, which I think is really neat. And there are a few programs that give you some specific guidelines on that, um, that can help you support ecosystems as a whole. And there are many more not listed here. Um, and so we're look, you're looking for programs that are supporting the whole ecosystem. So there's some like monarch programs that are really cool, but it's oftentimes like, do you have milkweed on your property? You're looking at something that's trying to holistically look at all of these things. Um, you want them to be looking at connecting wildlife habitat, increasing biodiversity, improving water quality and promoting healthy soils. So, um, you know, how are these practices um, helping doing all four of these things to help improve our landscapes. I wanted to leave this list up here if you're somebody to screenshot. I think somebody asked about slides. Um, I'll make like a quick slide deck, especially of like these tips um, to make sure you all have these um, because I think these are just like really nice quick tip ways. But what I wanna leave you all with is it's not exactly about these tips. It's about the, um, the, the theory behind why these tips are important. Um, so understanding, you know, relationships in nature, the natural selection and evolution of our, of our, of our species and then, and nature's cycles will help us um, make decisions beyond what's on that quick tip list. Um, you know, maybe something came up that you hadn't heard about before, a new thing that wasn't in this presentation. How do I address this? Well, understanding that, well, what I'm trying to do is maintain and encourage these cycles. So even though it wasn't a specific tip on Abigail's list, how can I help encourage and return carbon or nitrogen or, um, you know, how can I think about slowing the water down on the property, something like that. So I encourage you to think about these not as quick tips, but as, um, you know, mindsets and lenses in which you look at for managing your property. And that's all I have. I actually have this slide right here and I'm gonna leave this one up. So this QR code is actually the evaluation. I would really appreciate if you all took the time to fill it out and give me feedback, negative or positive, I'm or neutral, that's fine as well. I would also love if you all would be in, um, excited to join next month on Flatwater Kayaking. Um, that's June 8th at 1 p.m. My email is at the bottom. Always feel free if you have a longer question you wanna email me. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to stop the recording and answer questions. Thank you for tuning in to CU Wise TV. We hope you enjoyed the show. This video can be accessed anytime on youtube.com. In the YouTube search bar, type in UPTV6 and look for their microphone logo. We hope you will join us again next week for more local, engaging content designed specifically for Champaign County older adults. Take care.